The, the title of the message this morning is Triumphant. And I'll tell you, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff for you. For the most part, I'm going to be in the book of John. So you can feel free to turn there. Uh, you'll probably be able to follow along with me. But I have a feeling that what I'm bringing to you this morning, most of you have heard a lot of this stuff, but probably not in the way that I'm going to lay it out. So what I ask is that you just bear with me, because by the time we get to the end of it, it's all going to make sense for you, all right? But here we are on Resurrection Sunday. Now, this, in my opinion, is the absolute most important day to remember and to recognize what God truly did for us. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today is the most important day of every single year, in my opinion. Every day is extremely important. And every day, we can remember what God did for us. But today, today is so vital that we, that we set time aside and thank God for what He truly did. So, you might want to take notes as far as the scriptures that I'm hitting, and I'll tell you each one of them so that you can go back because at the end of the day, you may be going, man, what did he, where was that? How did he get to that point? And, but if you don't take notes, you can just hit me up and I'll send my notes over to you. No big deal. But first I want to start out in Isaiah 43.1. Isaiah 43.1 says, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name You are mine. This is what God is speaking to us. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, and you are mine is what he says. You are his. We are his. Oh, you're going to love this. I I love it. I get so stinking excited. The guys during the uh, early morning Bible study, we call it early morning, it's 6.30. That's not that early. But they have to listen to me ramble on and on, and and I just get so worked up over stuff, so I'm trying to contain myself here. So, Resurrection Sunday and what it truly means. I'm going to, I'm going to break this stuff down and show you what it truly means. If if you have a, a great understanding of it already, that's awesome. We all need refreshers. If you don't, and there's maybe some questions in your mind, I'm hoping that I'm going to clear those up for you today. So, I do have to warn you, though, I'm not like any typical preachers, probably, that you've ever seen or heard. Um, I'm a little rough around the edges. Sorry if that offends anybody. I'll try not to offend you, but it's happened. I'm just saying it's happened. So, hmm, thank you, Jesus. The teaching that I'm going to bring today is kind of a, it's a mix of of a a teaching that Brittany and I listened to several years ago. Actually, Robert Morris taught on a teaching. He's from Gateway Church down in Texas, and he's the one that, that brought this in this way, and so I really have to give him the credit for, um, kind of laying it out for me. Obviously, God's the one that reveals things to us, but man, the way that he laid it out, I'm like, wow, that's outstanding. So a lot of what I'm hitting uh, comes from his teaching, and if you want, you can find it. It's it's on Dominion, is what it's called, and it was in April of 2018 on Resurrection Sunday. So I got to give him a little bit of credit here. So as we're going, I'm going to kind of lay a foundation for you, and all of this starts in Genesis 1, 28. And this is about Adam and Eve, obviously. So it says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Dominion means sovereignty or control over. God gave Adam and Eve sovereignty and control over everything in the world, everything on the earth. He says, Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So they had dominion over all of it. Unfortunately, though, due to their disobedience for God, they handed over the dominion that God rightfully gave them to Satan. He tricked them, he lied to them, and they willfully gave it over. That's whenever the world entered into a severe amount of sin. Now, I'm going to take a a little side note for a second because I want to talk to you 
about those of you that may, that may have thought ever or that do think, well, God is hard to find. God, God tries to hide himself from me. God wants to play this little game of hide and seek with me. Well, I want to tell you, he doesn't do that. That's not his role. And if you go back to Adam and Eve, they were the ones that sinned. And whenever they sinned, what did they do? Who hid there? Was it God or was it Adam and Eve? It was, an, it was Adam and Eve. They hid themselves from God. And what did God do? He sought them. He went walking through the garden and he was calling out to them. He was seeking them to have relationship with them. They were drawing, they were pulling away. He was trying to draw into them. God's, God's role and his desire, his design is seek and find. Seek and find. He says time and time again, seek me and you will find me whenever you seek for me with all of your heart. He's not hard to find. He wants you to seek him. He wants you to seek him. So if you have any more questions about that, grab me after service and we'll talk about it. But Luke 4, 6 says, and the devil said to him, this is, this is the devil talking to Jesus here. Um, he's got a He's got a lot of nerve talking to Jesus this way because if you remember, the word says that Jesus watched Satan cast out of heaven like lightning. So here he is on earth after he was cast out of heaven like lightning. And he says to Jesus, he says, all authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered or given to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. So Jesus didn't argue with him. He didn't. He didn't need to argue with him because he was right. Dominion had been given over to Satan at this point. But, but Jesus knew what's coming. Jesus knew what was coming. In a short three years later, it was going to be his. And we're about to get to that. So right after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection... Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, Matthew 28, 18, he says, all authority has been given to me. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Satan had dominion. It was freely given to him, correct? I mean, we know that. So after the resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, he's telling the disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, not just in heaven. We know that he's God, but in heaven and on earth, all of that has been given to him. He commands it. He commands whatever he will. He commands it. So as I'm breaking this down, the way that I'm going to break it down is called um, a contextual exegete. And what that means is it means um, to draw out from the context, to draw out the meaning of what the speaker was saying. Okay. And so Follow with me here. If I, if I start to go in a direction that you're like, this dude has lost his thinking mind. Um, I probably have at some point, but on this, I'm good. I promise. And I'm going to lay it out for you. So, where I want to start now, where I want to start is at the Last Supper, the conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. Everybody knows about the Last Supper, right? We've seen the picture painted, and, and they're all sitting. Have you noticed that they're all sitting on one side of the table in that picture? Who does that? Nobody does that unless the table's up against the wall. Like I'm like, come on, man. But whatever, side note. Jesus says in John 14, 1 and 2, so now we're in the book of John 14, 1 and 2, he says, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Mansions, the word mansions there is only used in the New King James and the King James Version. Everywhere else, it says dwelling place. It's called dwelling place or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's going to prepare a place for us. Keep in mind. Jesus is speaking out, talking to his disciples right before he goes and gets brutally murdered, tortured, and crucified. Like, this is what he's talking to them about. Now, I want you to think spiritually whenever I'm laying all this stuff out, okay? Think spiritually. He's saying, 
I have to take care of some things. I'm going away. I have to take care of some things so that you can have a relationship with the Father. I have to do these things so that you can have a relationship with the Father. If I don't, you're going to still have to sacrifice. You're still going to have to do all these things, meet all these requirements in order for God to meet with you personally. So, and even still, they couldn't meet with him personally. But Jesus is preparing the way for them to meet with him personally, for you and I, for us to meet with the creator that spoke us into existence and breathed the breath of life into our lungs. He went to do this. So in John 14, 25 through 29, there's, there's some key points that I want you to pick up out of here. And they are the Holy Spirit and peace. The Holy Spirit and peace. Please remember those because I'm going to hit on them later and you'll see how it brings it all together. So, verse 25, 14, 25 says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. So, he's, he's telling them because he's sitting right there with them. He's present with them. But the Helper, which is who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Holy Spirit is going to help them understand what Jesus said. That's what he does for us today. I love it. If I didn't have him, I'd be totally lost. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. So, there's that other one, peace. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. He's not giving it the same way. Nobody has ever given anything the way that Jesus is giving them peace right now. Nobody ever. Nobody ever. These are, peace is one of the signs that, that's going to pull all this stuff together. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. I am going away and I'm coming back to you. Now, let me ask you something. Could he possibly be talking about the death and the resurrection? The death and the resurrection. This is right before he's going to be crucified. Now, I will tell you, so many people, and, and I'm one of them, all growing up, I've been taught and believed that this passage of Scripture is talking about his second coming. After he leaves, after he's taken up into heaven, whenever they watch him go up into heaven, all these Scriptures that I'm going over right now, everybody believes, not everybody, but lots of people have believed that it was, it's talking about then, not, not this, not the, um, the crucifixion and his resurrection from the crucifixion. So... Let me break some stuff down for you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you, before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So, do you, do you, do you understand what's going on here? He's sitting there with his disciples at the Last Supper, and he's telling you, I'm telling you what's going to happen so that when it does happen, you will believe. So that you will believe what's going on. Let me tell you something. If this was talking about the second coming, no one would have any hard time believing in that. Every single person is going to know when Jesus is coming back. Every single person is going to see him coming back and know that he came back. And the word says in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single one of them. That's to include the Muslims, the Hindus, the atheists, even atheists that don't believe that there is a God. They will believe at that point in time. Every single tongue will confess. Every single knee will bow. So why would Jesus be talking about this? Why would he say, and now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. He's talking about the death and the resurrection of him coming back at that point. This is going to be a key factor in where we're going here. John 16, 16 through 22 says, A little while, 
and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. A little while. He says, a little while. A little while, you will not see me. He's getting ready to be crucified. He's going to be buried. For three days, he's going to be dead in a grave, and they won't see him because a stone has rolled over the grave. But then he says, and in a little while, three days later, you're going to see me again. But why? Because I go to the Father. I love this, man. This is so awesome. So, the time frame makes more sense. If he says, in a little while, you're not going to see me, and in a little while, you will see me, why would he use a little while for a day and a half, and then a little while for 2,000 years at least? Right? That doesn't make sense. Jesus makes sense. He's not out to trick us. And this is him talking at the Last Supper with his disciples. So then he says, then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So these, his disciples are going, what is he talking about? What's he talking about? It's easy for us to look back and go, well, this is clearly what he's talking about. How, couldn't they, how did they not pick that up? Well, it's because it didn't happen yet. I wouldn't have picked it up either, I'm sure. Would I, baby? Don't answer that. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's saying. Now, Jesus knew. Of course he knew. He's Jesus. He knows what's going on in their heart. He knows what they're saying. He knows what they're questioning. So Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, they didn't even ask. Did you hear that? He knew that they desired to ask him, and he answered it without them even asking. Isn't that just like our God? Isn't He wants to fulfill our desires. He wants to answer our, our questions about him. That's how much he loves us. He's not trying to hide from us. He answers before they even ask. That's amazing. I love it. So, now Jesus knew what they desired to ask him, and so he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, you will see me? Most assuredly, he's saying seriously, seriously, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Listen to this. Listen to this. He says, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. They wept. They were crushed. They were hurt deeply. Their best friend that they loved more than anything in the whole wide world that they gave every single thing up for is going to be taken from them and brutally tortured and murdered. They're going to weep and lament. But then he said, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Did they weep and lament whenever he went up into heaven after he rose from the dead? No. Now, whenever he was crucified, yes, he wept. He was very sorrowful. They, they wept. They were very sorrowful. But not whenever he was taken up into heaven, whenever they all watch him ascend into heaven. No one was crying at that point. The word doesn't say anybody cried at that point. It says they were staring into the sky going, wow. I mean, I, I assume they said, wow. I don't think it says it there. But I mean, if you were there, wouldn't you be saying, wow, that's cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, they got to see something pretty cool. But they weren't weeping and lamenting at that point. You know, so that's, that's what we're doing here. We're pulling the truth out of the scripture and what Jesus is clearly telling them. Therefore, okay, so in verse 22, it says, Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. You're going to be filled with joy, and no one can take your sorrow from you, or no one can take your joy from you. Think about what the disciples did after Jesus ascended into heaven after that. No one could take their joy from them. 
All of them but one was martyred. All of them but one was brutally killed for the most part. Pretty much all of them brutally killed for Jesus. And even by killing them, it couldn't take their, their joy from them. They would never turn from Jesus again because the impact that he made in their lives. And they made that impact in so many other lives. So, John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, that's very important, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. I would assume that maybe Mary went every single day. But maybe Mary was the only one that was listening when Jesus said, I'm going to be gone for three days, and then the Son of Man will be raised again. Isn't that just like a woman to be listening when all these other guys are not listening? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Amen with me in her. So, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. It was early in the morning. It was early on resurrection day. The very first day of the week. Now, this... Oh, I love this so much. John 20, 11 through 17. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. Naturally, she's weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She looked into the tomb. The huge stone had been rolled away. She looks into the tomb and she saw two angels sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus was laying. One at the head, one at the feet. If you think about it, what she was looking in at was, was an image of the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody know what the Ark of the Covenant looked like? It had two cherubim on each side and their wings touched in the middle, one at the head, one at the foot, and God dwelled within. Oh, I don't know. I, just, oh, I love it. It's so awesome. So that's, we, we don't have time to get into too much of it, but then they said to her, she looks in, they're like, hey, Mary. They said, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? They knew something she didn't know. That's why. She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not where that, know where they have laid him. Mary, in her mind, is thinking that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were trying to sabotage something. They came in and took the body of Jesus, is what she's thinking. Where where'd they take him? Where did they take him? Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Mary. Mary did not recognize Jesus, who she had just spent at least, most, most uh, theologians think at least two and a half years with Jesus. His ministry lasted three and a half years, roughly, on the earth. She was with him most of that time. She knew Jesus, not in a physical, intimate relationship, but she knew him. She knew him because he had, he had cast out seven demons out of her. He changed her life from the inside out. Changed her whole entire life. She knew him. Knew him. She loved him more than anything in the whole world. But at this point, she didn't even recognize him. Isn't that interesting? To me, that's very interesting. Now, one preacher said, probably more than one, but one in particular said that she didn't recognize him because he was so badly beaten. Now, the word does say that he was extremely, horribly beaten, so much so that essentially his own mother wouldn't be able to recognize him. That's how badly he was beaten. But that hypothesis does not make sense because Mary helped take his body off of the cross and prepare it for burial. She saw exactly what he looked like. Exactly what he looked like. You don't, you got to think. 
This is one of her be- this is her best friend. That image would have been feared into her mind. Yet whenever he starts talking to her, she doesn't recognize him. She doesn't recognize him. We'll get to we'll get to why here in a minute. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Isn't that interesting? He said the same thing the angels that he created said to her. He's asking, why are you weeping? And then he says, whom are you seeking? Like he doesn't know. He does that with me all the time. He just wants me to tell him. She, supposing him to be the gardener. The gardener. Oh, this dude must take care of the garden. He's here real early, you know. And he's just wandering around asking me what I'm doing here. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I'll take care of him. Just tell me where you put him. She's desperate at this point. Desperate at this point. She didn't recognize him by his looks or by the sound of his voice. Mary didn't recognize the way he looked or the way he sounded. What happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He took on all the weight, all the pressure of the sin of every single one of us and every single human who's ever lived and ever will live, took every bit of it on. Have you ever seen somebody that that you look at and you're like, whoa, that person's evil. They got some evil in them. Or you look at somebody that's filled with the Holy Spirit and they're super joyful. You're like, wow. That's kind of contagious, you know, but you can see it. You can tell in who they are and how, the, how they carry themselves. You can see it. He, all she saw was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit for two and a half years, and then he had to take on all the sin and the weight of the world. All this stuff had happened. And then, so Jesus did something to her at this point and allowed her to be able to see him, allowed her to be able to hear him and understand who he is. So Jesus said, Mary, with an exclamation point, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. That's what she always called him, Rabboni. And Jesus said to her, so immediately, whenever he said Mary, she recognized him. He allowed her to recognize him at this point. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, because naturally she's like, Jesus! probably wants to jump on him, hug him, be so happy and and overjoyed that he's alive. He did what he said he's going to do. He came back to life. This is incredible. So she goes to him and he says, don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. Let me explain why. 36 times in the translated uh, text of the Bible, it's translated touch. The exact same word that they use here that says cling to, cling to is actually translated to touch. The woman with the issue of blood, Jesus is in this huge crowd and and he feels someone come up and, and just touch his robe and he feels the power go out of him. And he says, who touched me? And his disciples are like, what are you talking about, dude? There's a thousand people around you. Everyone touched you. He's like, no, 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 no. Somebody believed and they touched me. Power went out of me and healed them. Who touched me? It's that exact same word here. The the same word touch is the exact same word that they they translated here into cling. I don't know why they did that, but Jesus says, don't touch me. Here's the key. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. You're all like, yeah, so? But then he says, but go and tell my brethren, the real stubborn ones that don't listen real well, go tell them because if they did listen, they would be here right now with you. They would have been here. Go tell them that I um, go tell them that I am, I am ascending. That's a present tense. What does your Bible say? It's present tense. I am ascending to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father. To my father and to your father. That's what I want you to tell them. I'm leaving right now. I'm ascending. I am to my father and to your father. That's where I'm going. He tells her to go tell them this. I love it. He tells, them, tells her to go tell them. 
So, in John 20, 19 through 22, then the same day at evening, when was it? The same day she went there to the tomb early in the morning. While it was still dark even, she took off. She didn't jump in the car and drive there, so it took a little bit to get there, right? She had to walk, get your steps in, you know? So, but it's the same day. Now, it's an evening. Now it's an evening. I don't know how long it took her to go tell the disciples, but now it's evening time. If I were them, I would have been rolling trying to get him. Somebody hook up the chariot, baby. Hook it up. Let's go. Then, the same day at evening... Where's he been all day? Yeah, where's he been all day? Being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, so they were scared of the Jews because they just murdered Jesus in front of everyone. They were scared of the Jews, so they were locked in a room. They went and locked themselves in a room, and Jesus came and stood in their midst. Guess what? He didn't have the key. He just came and stood in their midst. He's like, what's up? And I guarantee you, they were like, oh! Like whenever they're out on the boat and they see him walking across the water, they're all terrified because they think they see a ghost, but it's really Jesus who's filled with the Holy Ghost. I kind of get it. But Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. There's that word, peace. Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, because they drove a spear up into his side instead of breaking his knees just to make sure that he was dead whenever they were all freaking out because of the earthquakes going on and, and all the craziness whenever Jesus was, was dying. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. He was gone all day. He said, go tell them Go tell my disciples that I am ascending now. I am ascending. And then, then he shows up, boom, that evening. He was with the Father all day. And he says, touch me. Check this out. See the holes in my hands? See my side? It's me. It's really me. It actually is. And what did he tell them before that? Actually, a few days later, he, he did tell Thomas straight up, Stick your hand on my side. Woo! I've seen some nasty, gross stuff, you know. And I've, you know, I've been there, I've done that. But I don't know that I'd stick my hand inside some dude's side, even if he said, stick your hand on my side. Like, I, I did pull out a bullet out of my own ribs. But that was myself, you know. I mean, I'm not going to be digging around in somebody else. I don't know how medics do it, that's weird. But Jesus says, the point here that I'm trying to make is Jesus says, touch me. What did he tell Mary at the grave? He said, don't touch me. Don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now he's saying, the same day, that evening, touch me. Touch me. The same day. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Where's he been all day? He's been with the Father. And the Father sent him, and now he's sending them that same day. The Father sent me, now I'm sending you. That's exactly what's going on here. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be to you, Receive the Holy Spirit. What did he tell them back in John 14, 29 that we just read earlier? And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. And he gives them two signs. You're going to have peace and the Holy Spirit. Those are the two things that are come that will come to you after I ascend to the Father. And this is exactly what happened. They got peace and they got the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I set timers. Keep me on track. Because if not, I mean, you guys might miss lunch or something. I hope not. No, you won't. I promise you won't. I still have time. Peace and the Holy Spirit are the two signs. Now, Ephesians 
tells us that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth three days while in the tomb. That's in Ephesians. So for those three days that he was dead, he did ascend to the lower parts of the earth. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. The short version, though, instead of reading all the way through that, essentially he goes up to to Satan and he says, give me the keys back, they're mine. Give them back. Jesus, or Satan, was trying to tell him, I'll give you dominion, I'll give you the authority, I can give it to whoever I want. And Jesus says, you're right, and now I'm taking it. Give it to me. Oh, this dude, he's a brawler. He's a brawler, he's my kind of guy. Hebrews 19, 12. Not with blood of goats. You might want to write this down. Not with the blood of goats and calves, because they would always have to sacrifice something to be able to forgive them or cleanse them of their sins. Sins could only be atoned for with blood, with the sacrifice of something, with killing something to present. Something had to die, and it was with blood. So, Hebrews 9.12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, Jesus' own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Having obtained eternal redemption. He was triumphant at that point. John 12.31. John 12.31, you might want to remember this, it's pretty important. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. He says, now. He doesn't say 2,000 years from now, the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. He says, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Right now. Now can only mean now, right? I mean, has, has anybody, have you ever told your kids to clean the room or something? And they're like, yeah, I'll get to it. And you're like, now. And they're like, I'll get to it. Now means now. Do it now. And that's what he's saying here. That's exactly what that meaning is. Now. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. It would be super cool if there was like a verse-by-verse description of what happened over those three days, right? Wouldn't that be neat if there was? There is, and we're going to cover it. In Daniel 7, 9 through 14. Daniel 7, 9 through 14. You want to know what happened over those three days while Jesus was in the grave? You're about to find out. Most people, whenever they read Daniel, they think that it's all pertaining to revelations. It's all pertaining to the end days, the end time. They think that that Daniel's prophecies were all the end time, like what's going on now, essentially. But we're going to break this down a little bit. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who's the Ancient of Days? The Father God. God Himself. The Father. The Big Daddy. He was seated. His garment was white as snow. The clothes that he wore was white as snow. It says, whiter than tide could get them. It doesn't say that. That's what my mind tells me whenever I read that. And the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels of burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And a thousand thousands... A thousand thousands, is one million, ministered to him. And 10,000 times 10,000, that's a hundred million people were around. That's what, that's what uh, Daniel's seeing here. A hundred million people stood before him, and the court was seated, and the books were opened. You know, this is, this is probably one of the big reasons why people believe that this is in Revelations, because it's, it's, it's a judgment. And there is a judgment seat coming, and there's a great white throne judgment coming as well. I'm not saying that there's not. There absolutely is. There are those two judgments coming. But this is also, Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the judgment of this world. Not 2,000 years from now, whenever, all, whenever these judgments are going on, the world is being judged now. And Jesus paid the price for it. So, a judgment took place on resurrection day. A judgment took place on Resurrection Day. He says, I watched 
Then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, the horn is um, one, of the, uh, one of the beasts, he says, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. He's watching this beast that had pompous words that was running his stinking mouth, essentially, and God took him out. He's saying, I'm watching this. I'm watching this take place on this judgment day that already happened. It already happened, guys. He's watching this happen. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. That beast was already cast in. There's four beasts in Daniel. This is the first one. Everybody's like, well, Revelation talks about the beast. Well, there's four. This is the first one. This is what happened to the first one. And on that day, sin was destroyed there. On that day, sin was destroyed there. Romans 6.14. You don't believe me? I'll, I'll point it out for you. Romans 6.14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. That day, sin no longer had dominion. Jesus went and paid his price, paid the price that we couldn't pay, lived the life we couldn't live, died the death that we couldn't die, so that we could have that relationship with him, and sin was paid for on that day. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. You're like... You're like, well, what do you mean? There's still sin in the world. Yes, there is still sin in the world. Listen to this. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I wish he would have just slain them too and cast them into the fire 2,000 years ago, but if he did, I probably wouldn't be here today. Isn't this stuff awesome? I love this stuff. This is like the coolest stuff ever. This is the greatest news that anyone could ever get in the entire world. This is the best news of the Bible. This is the best news you will ever get, you will ever hear. It doesn't get better than this. It does not get better than this. I was watching. So this is verse 13. So this is um, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions... And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He's watching. He's seeing the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. We read that and we go, clouds of heaven were coming with this dude? Like, what's that supposed to mean? The clouds of heaven were coming with him. Let me tell you what the clouds of heaven were, because this is one of my favorite parts. I love this. While he was there, he gathered up. So, so. We're kind of jumping into another part. He says, while he was there, he gathered up the great cloud of witnesses who were in Abraham's bosom. This is the resting place. So people, yes, um, if they were sinners and they would not accept God and they didn't want to have anything to do with God whatsoever and they're worshiping Baal and Malak and all this stuff and, and they refused to believe in God, then they went to hell. They absolutely did. The word clearly says it. But if not, they went to Abraham's bosom, which was the resting place, which was where God was holding them, allowing them to rest, a place to rest. People are like, no, whenever you die, you just go to the grave. You just go to the end of the ground from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. No, sorry, that's absolutely not correct. It's not biblical whatsoever. That is not the truth. What happened before Jesus is they went to Abraham's bosom and they are the great cloud of witnesses. So check out Matthew 27, 52 through 53. I'm, I hit on this a couple weeks ago whenever I taught because I think it's one of the coolest thinking things that's ever happened, and I wish I could have seen it. It says, Matthew 27, 52 through 53, coming out of the graves is what I kind of titled it. It says, and the graves were open. So Jesus was just crucified. He's hanging on the cross. He just died right now. This is, what, this is where we are in the context here. And the graves were opened up, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. They were raised. They had fallen asleep. They died. That's what that means. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So Jesus wasn't the only one that was resurrected here. We have all of these saints 
They come out of the grave and they're wandering through the city. People that have been dead forever. Forever. They're like, wandering. imagine, it says that, that people saw them. Lots of people saw them. Imagine that you start seeing these people that are walking around. You're like, what is going? This has been a weird weekend, guys. This has been kind of different, you know? Oh, look what's going on here. It's nuts. I, I love his sense of humor because... Why were they? They didn't have to go wandering around. They didn't have to go wandering around the, the city of Jerusalem, but they wanted to. So coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. <laughs> oh, man. I just love it. I love it. So essentially, what's going on is Jesus went and got the keys back, right? He's like, Satan, hand them over, sucker. He gets the keys back, and he tells these guys, after he picks them up out of Abraham's bosom, he's like, look, we're headed to go see the Father, but i got to make a stop before that. He's like, i got to go talk to Mary, and i got to tell her what's happening here, because I already told my disciples, and they didn't listen, and everybody knows, if you want to get a job done, you ask a woman to do it. Right? So, so... He's literally, he, he's telling them, we're going to the Father. We're going to go see him, but I got to make a stop first. And they're like, hey, got a question for you. Would you be all right if we like went and checked out Jerusalem? It's been a while since I've seen it. And he's like, yeah, sure, you can do that. No problem. Don't get in any trouble. It's probably what he said. <laughs> he probably didn't say that. He probably didn't need to. If I was with him, though, I bet he would have said that. Like, uh, like my leaders in the military, they're like, don't go to Tijuana. And I'm like, Tijuana, that sounds fun. What's in Tijuana? They're like, don't go. And I'm like, let's go to Tijuana. Come on, let's go. Just went to Tijuana. I'll tell you that right now. So we're going to continue on. Verse 13, and Jesus, he, Jesus, came to the ancient of days, came to the Father God, and they brought him near before him. So if you read anything about heaven and about God and what it looks like there, and he's got these amazing angels that he's created, he's spoken them into existence, and they, they serve him constantly, and they want to. They love him. They serve him constantly. They take Jesus. Jesus comes up. Jesus is the prince of heaven. Jesus is the son of the father, yet there's a protocol that needs to be followed, and he follows it. He's still Jesus, you know what I mean? He could roll right in, believe me. He could roll right in. But they took him up, they ushered him up. They're like, hey, Jesus, what's up, man? It's been a while, like, what, 33 years probably, something like that? Come on, I'll take you to see the Father. So they take him in to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then verse 14 says, then to him, Jesus, then, so this is what's going on, then to him, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. And dominion is an everlasting dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. At that moment, 2,000 years ago, this is what took place. He was given dominion. It was taken from Satan and given back to Jesus because it was rightfully his. Rightfully his. Daniel 7, 21 through 22. Daniel 7, 21 through 22. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So this is, this is another snapshot of what was going on with that one beast. The same horn was making war against the saints. We've, we've seen some war, haven't we? And prevailing against them, it was winning until, until, Daniel 7, 22, if you want to pick this up, he says, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints, us, of the saints, of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom until the Ancient of Days came in. He was winning until the Ancient of Days comes in. The Father steps in. The Father steps in and changes everything. He changes everything. 
It was Jesus' time. Jesus paid the price. The Father steps in and boom, it's done. It's done because He created everything. He spoke everything into existence. And He was done allowing it to have its ravaging rampage over all of us. He was finished with it. He took dominion and He gave it back to Jesus. Colossians, New Testament, Colossians 2.15, says, having disarmed principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Triumphing over them. That's, isn't that awesome? He made a public spectacle. He's not like, hey, step into this room. I need to talk to you about something behind closed doors so everybody doesn't see me embarrass you. No, no. He said, you've had your time. There's fun and sin for a season, but that season is over. It's absolutely over. And you're going to pay for it, and everybody's going to know it. Everybody's going to see it. This is our free gift, the dominion. This happened 2,000 years ago. We don't have to wait for the second coming for us to claim the dominion. Jesus claimed it for us and He gave it back to us. That's what He was saying on the mount whenever He was speaking to His disciples in that room and on the mount that He told them to go to. He's saying, dominion is mine. It's been given to me rightfully. I paid for it with my own flesh and blood and now I'm giving it to you. He's giving it to you. It's been given to you all you have to do is accept it, take it, walk in it. Ask, repent, ask for forgiveness of your sins and take dominion. It's yours. It's absolutely yours. Now, something that else that I wanted to address, I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap up here real quick. But I keep hearing more and more people saying that Jesus is only one way to heaven. Lots of people are jumping on this bandwagon. They want to say that there's a lot of ways to heaven. I'm here to tell you that there's not a lot of ways to heaven. There's one way to heaven. One and only one. Absolutely one and only one. And in John 14, 6, it says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. That is the way. There's no other way. Period. I don't care what anybody's told you. If they've told you different, it's a lie. I promise. I absolutely promise. So, I want you to not get hung up on the fact that there's only one way to heaven. Don't get hung up on that fact that there's only one way. But what I do want you to re do is rejoice that there is a way to heaven. There's a way to heaven. Why, why would anybody care if there's 20 or 1? There is a way to heaven. It's that way. It's that one Take it, rejoice that you get to go to heaven, that you get to spend eternity with the Father God. That is your way. You want to get there? This is the way to do it. So, the first verse that I started out with was Isaiah 43.1. Isaiah 43.1. I want to bring you back to this because it's so important for you to understand who you are and whose you are. Isaiah 43.1. Do not fear. Isn't it great to know that God doesn't want us living in fear? Isn't it great to know that He's not hiding in the corner, going to jump out and scare you? He tells us more times to not fear than pretty much anything else in the Word. He doesn't want you to fear. Don't be afraid. We don't have to be afraid because He's got it all under control. He's got it all. He says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. You don't have to fear your past. You don't have to fear the decisions that you made that you feel have damned you to hell. You don't have to because he says, I have personally redeemed you. Don't fear, I have redeemed you. And then he says, I've called you by name. He's called you, he's called you, he's called you, he's called you, he's called me, he's called every single one of us in here by name because the word says that he knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. Before the foundations of the earth was laid, he knew you. That's how long He's known you. You might feel insignificant. You might feel like that nobody sees you, nobody hears you, nobody cares about you. It's not true. The most important being in the entire universe that created the whole universe knows you, cares about you, loves you, wants you, and created you so He could have that relationship with you. That's the whole reason He created you. Because you're wanted. Because He loves you and He wants you. 
That's why he created you. He's telling you right here, it's in black and white, guys. He says, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. And then he says, I haven't just called you by name, but you are mine. You are mine. That is God speaking. The one that spoke you into existence is saying, you're mine. I claim you. I claim you. You're mine. So, when did he call us? He called us before we loved him. Before we loved him, he called us. What are you saying, Briggs? You're saying that, that he, he called me before I did anything to please him? Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly who he is. He called you before we loved him, not after we were obedient to him. Doesn't this go against everything that, that we've set up in our own structure in the world? After we were obedient, well, if I do everything right, then he's going to love me. Nope, that's absolutely not the case. He called you before you were even obedient to him. He called you. While we were in the middle of our sin, the word says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, he went to the cross. And here's another thing. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, here he is, flesh and blood, man and God. He's God and man, both the same, wrapped up into the same wonderful package. He's praying to the Father. Lord, God, Dad, Dad, if there's any other way to do this, please, please let's do it another way. If you can take this from me, if I don't have to, if I don't have to willingly walk, like the sheep to the slaughter, if you can do it some other way where I don't have to get brutally tortured and murdered, please do that. And then he came back and he asked the same thing again after he goes and sees his disciple friends sleeping. He comes back and says the same thing, God, God, please, mm, please, if there's some other way to do this, please let's do it that way. But, not what I want, God. Not what I want, Dad. I'll do whatever you want. And he says, son, it has to be this way. It has to be this way, and you know it has to be this way. And so he says, okay, I'll do it. He knew. He knew that we would still be sinning. While we were in the middle of our sins, he still willingly did it. Before we even agreed to be his children, he still did it. He still willingly went and did all of this, knowing the pain and suffering that he would have to go through for the joy of having us, for the joy of bringing us in, for the joy of forgiving all those sins, to wipe them out. He's like, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. Have your kids ever done anything? And you're like, ooh, that's bad. They're going to have to pay for that. Yet you step in because you love them and you don't want them to have to suffer. Have you ever done that? That's what he did for you and for me, especially for me, probably way more so than for you. But that's what he did. He did it before we, were even, before we even agreed to be his. And he did it because he loves us. Here's what's awesome. He did it because he knows that we are not who we are going to be. Me, back in my life of sin, I'm telling you guys, any one of you would have looked at me and said, that dude's out of control. You know why? Because I was out of control. Way out. I was outside there. Y'all were like, oh, surely not this guy standing up on the stage. Nope. Guarantee you. You'd be like, I'm not getting near that guy. So, I want to end with this. I promise you, I promise you this, that God wants to heal your heart today. He wants to. That's why he did this. He wants to heal your heart. He wants to heal your body. He wants to heal your relationships. He wants to heal your memories, the thoughts that you just can't seem to get over. He wants to heal those. 
He wants to take them away from you. He didn't want you to have them in the first place. He didn't want you to have them. He didn't, it's not your burden to bear. He took it from you 2,000 years ago. He already took it. He can even redeem your choices and use them for good. The choices that you made that you're like, I can't go to God now. Look at the things I've done. I can't go to him. And that's what Satan's whispering in your ear. You can't go to God. What's this righteous God going to do with an unholy you? Right? That's what we've all thought. I've thought it a million times. Believe it or not, I still sometimes think it. I'm like, God, how in the world? I'm afraid I'm ashamed to even go to you because I know what's going on in here. You guys don't. It's a good thing. You wouldn't, you'd be like, don't let that dude on stage again. Okay? But he wants to heal that and he wants to use it for good. I'm the living proof of it. He's the living proof of it. This word is truth. Believe me whenever I say every follower of Jesus Christ has a not so great past. However, every follower of Jesus also has an after, has the after. You can step right into it. We were made for more than this. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning, guys. For us, it's just the beginning. It all just now started. So, I'm going to close with that. And I want to invite each and every one of you. We're going to play one last worship song. And I want each and every one of you to continue in the thought process of what God has done for you. And if you feel like that, that you need prayer for anything, I don't care what it is. I literally... I don't care what it is. I'm not going to judge you. Nobody that's going to be up here is going to judge you. But the elders are going to be up here, and we want to pray with you because we are lives that are changed. Our lives were changed. Your lives can be changed. If you need healing for something, you need restoration in something, you need set free from something, or you know somebody that does, or you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, or you need to dedicate your life to the Lord and say, God, I can't believe you did this for me, but I accept it. I take it. I'll take it right now. I'll give you the rest of everything I am, everything I've got. Then come up. We will pray for you. We'll gladly pray for you.